Um, this happened in 2020 um, on two occasions, not just one. Um, but long story short, I was scammed. Um, once at the beginning of the year and the second time um, it was on my birthday. The first time was for a projector, the second time was for an electric scooter, which were popular at the time. Um, yeah, I just felt like I wanted to treat myself to some pretty good things, but lo and behold, the things never came. I paid and the, the gifts never came. Um, and yeah, all my birthday money down the drain. Um, and not many people know this story, so count yourselves as lucky. Um, the reason why I haven't told many people is because it's a shameful thing. It's a really, really shameful thing. It's embarrassing um, to be scammed not once, but twice. Um, and, you know, I kind of just want to ask you guys the question, have you ever found yourself in situations where you felt shameful? And it, it kind of it reminded me of the story of the prodigal son. Um, some of you may know it, but I'm just going gonna, gonna to summarize it. Um, so there was a father, he had two sons, and one of the sons asked for a share of his estate. He asked early, and that in and of itself would have been a shameful act. And anyway, so he gets his, um, his share, he goes afar, and he, blow, he blows through all the money. He's living a wild lifestyle, and he finds himself in lots and lots of trouble. And then he turns to very extreme measures um, in order to, to survive. He, um, he was feeding pigs, and not only feeding pigs, but he was also eating with pigs. And when you think about it, this is a, is a Jewish man, and knowing what the Old Testament says about, about swine, you can just imagine how, just how low he had to stoop. Um, but anyways, he came to his senses and decided that he, wants to, you know, he wanted to come back to his father. And he, he prepared this whole speech about, he was going to say, oh, father, I have sinned against you and I've sinned against heaven. I'm no longer worthy of being called your son. So... Yeah, um, so now, now, now picture this. He's walking to his father's house. He's walking, and the father sees him from a distance, and he was filled with compassion. And the Greek word, I'm not going to pronounce it, but it means a visceral, gut-wrenching, emotional response that is so strong that we are physically caused to move, move to action. And that's, that's exactly what the father did. The father ran. He saw him. He ran. He jets towards him, throws his arms around him, and he kisses him. And the son, at that point, the son recites the, the speech. Well, it's more so three sentences, but he says, I have sinned against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. And the father was having none of it. He saw it as a call for celebration. He called the servants to put on the nicest clothes on him um, and sandals. It was probably the, the Chanel or Gucci or Prada, whatever, of the day. But it was really nice stuff. Um, and, and they feasted. They celebrated. And the father said, for this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost, and now he is found. And there's more that happens after, but that's where I'm going to, going to stop the story. We're going to focus in on the, the redemptive and restorative and forgiving nature of God. Now, how many of us have been prodigals at some point in our lives? How many, how many of us have fallen into sin so much so that we don't feel like we can come back to our Father in heaven? I know that I have. But the good news is that just like the prodigal son, there's nothing more than a loving father filled with compassion, with open arms waiting for us to come back home. Earlier this year, I was invited to speak um, at a youth conference in New York, and, and the week leading up, the enemy really, really used that as, as an opportunity to, to bring up my past in order to accuse me, to discourage me from doing what God had called me to do, and that led me to condemning myself. I was really deep in self-condemnation for a sin that the blood had already washed me clean from. And often when we go astray or fall into sin, the enemy likes to keep us there. He likes to keep us in a place in sin or a place in sorrow, but he just wants us far from God. He may accuse you. you know, the scriptures say that he's the accuser of the brethren, and he does that by many ways. He may tell you, oh, you're the worst sinner. You don't deserve God's love, or you're the worst Christian. Look, you, look what you've done. Or he may even point to your past, and he does all that to keep you far from God, the same way that the prodigal son was distant to his father. And sometimes, you know, when we fall far, we, we, we fall bad, we fall remorse, but if that remorse doesn't lead us to run back to our father in repentance, then it's not from God, because the, the scriptures teach that godly sorrow is what leads to repentance. Keyword, godly sorrow, and it leads to repentance. It doesn't lead to self-condemnation or us just feeling ashamed, not feeling like we can run back to our father. When, when the scriptures talk about us fleeing from sin, we, we don't run to nothing. We run to God. We run to our Father in heaven. 
Yeah, Hebrews 4.16 says that we run to God's throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. God is merciful. God is forgiving. God is gracious. And he, he just wants us to come to him when we fall far from him. And he's made it ready and available for us to come to him in those moments. Yeah, 1 John 1.9, it says that if we confess our sins, he is faithful and he is just to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's all it takes, that one step of repentance. And I get it, it can be hard. It can be hard. Even before or after coming back, the enemy will accuse you. He may shame you. You, might, you may find yourself in self-condemnation. But the Bible says, Romans 8, 1 says that there's no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. No condemnation, none at all. And once we repent and come back to the Father, according to, to Hebrews 8, 12, it says that he remembers our sins no more. Our, our slates are wiped clean. And instead, this, the story of the prodigal son, it, it teaches that the father rejoices. You know, in the same chapter at the beginning, it, it teaches that the heavens also rejoice over just one sinner, just one sinner that repents. Like, isn't that amazing? You, you can just picture Paul or Abraham breakdancing or the angels in formation doing the Macarena. I don't know, but they are happy. They are cheering you on. And then that's, that's how much we mean to God. That's how much we mean to him that when just over one person that comes back to him is a call for celebration. It's a call for celebration. And if there's any prodigals in this room, I just want to encourage you that there is grace for you. That's freely, freely offered to you. God will run to you as you run to him. You know, the, the beauty of, of the story of the prodigal son was that as, as the son was walking, the father saw him and he ran towards him as well. So God will meet you in the middle. It's not all on you to run towards him. And we run with boldness. We don't walk with shame. Because Jesus took our shame upon him on the cross. The Bible says that he who knew no sin, Jesus, a pure, spotless, righteous lamb of God, says that he became sin. So that moment on the cross, it was he, like he became our sin. Our sin was put upon him. The worst things that you could think of was on him in that moment. And it says that he became sin so that we, me, you, could become the righteousness of God. So that when God looks at us, he sees Christ in us. He sees his Christ's righteousness, which is imparted onto us. So let us rejoice in that, church. Let's rejoice that we can come to our Father in repentance, and we can come to him with boldness and assurance that we're going to receive nothing but love and grace and compassion. Amen.